started. So thank you so much for tuning in for another session of EI Live uh, K-12 for students, educators, families. Uh, my name is Cassie and I oversee educational and outreach activities uh, across the Earth Institute. And for those of you who aren't familiar with the Earth Institute, our core mission is to foster a greater understanding of the science behind climate change uh, and what we as global citizens can do. So the Earth Institute is actually made up of many different research centers and many different experts, um, everyone for, from uh, geoscientists uh, to economists, business and policy experts, specialists in public health. Um, and the Institute uh, is made up, as I said, of about two dozen or so research centers and a couple hundred people who collaborate across many different departments and disciplines at Columbia University. What we are hoping to do with these EI Lab K-12 sessions is to introduce uh, everyone to that to our interdisciplinary work through our scientific experts. We're going to have these weekly sessions until the end of June, and hopefully you'll be able to join us for some of those remaining sessions. Um, if you have any questions about the upcoming sessions, please don't hesitate to contact me directly. So today we are super lucky to have Dr. Brad Lindsley of Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory, which is the largest center that is part of the Earth Institute. And he's going to be speaking to us about corals um, and just how important corals are um, in helping us piece together uh, past climate. Um, and so we are going to be using the Q&A box for today's presentation. So if you have a question, please uh, write it out in there. We'll be sure to address those questions once uh, Brad has done his presentation. Um, and then we will uh, be recording everything and everyone will get a copy of the recording as well as any additional resources and links that are also shared. Uh, we're going to have a colleague of ours uh, from NASA and the Goddard, Goddard Institute of Space Studies, NASA GIS, join us at the end to talk about some NASA resources that are also available for students to use that are related to corals. Uh, so without further ado, uh, Brad, you can go ahead and get started. Right. Oh wait, sorry, Brad, uh, you have to unmute yourself. There you go, perfect. There we go. Hello, everybody. I'm Brad Lindsley. I'm a paleoclimatologist. So I understand you can't verbally respond um, what paleo means. So what does paleo mean? Um, I'm paleo. Paleo means um, older, ancient, um, or it's a Greek word. And so we're going to be talking about how we use corals to look at past climate, particularly past climate over the last several hundred years today. I'm going to show you some how we, what the corals look like, how we collect samples and how we analyze them and a little bit of data at the end. There's a link down here at the bottom to a Reuters article about my work that was um, published um, about a year ago. It's a really interesting article with really cool graphics if you want to check it out. So why do we want to understand past climate? Well, this is a a graph. I'm going to be showing you some uh, graphs like this. And on these graphs, um, it's time is going to be on this bottom axis. And the youngest part is going to be over here on the right hand side. And so this is global temperatures and temperatures have been going up, and as you probably have all heard. But it's gone up in an uneven way. And we're very um, concerned about why it's going up. We think it's related to carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. But we don't know much about global temperatures before even about 1950 or so. That's where the um, record before this is a little bit uncertain. We're also very concerned about another aspect of climate change, and that is what's called ocean acidification. This carbon dioxide we're putting into the atmosphere um, is making the carbon dioxide level go up in the atmosphere, this red line. It's just going to get more younger to the right. But that carbon dioxide is also dissolving into seawater, making it more acidic. Now, this is a, an acidic scale over here called pH. And there's some common things in here that are acidic, like grape juice and lemon juice and coffee. Um, milk is here. Seawater is in the middle of this scale. And things that are what are called basic would be like cleaners and bleaches. So, but seawater is pretty much in the middle, but it is getting more acidic starting from the data we do have. And it's due to this carbon dioxide. We want to see whether this is going to affect corals. 
So why coral? Why do we use corals for climate? Um, well, I'm going to show you they have a very unique property, and that is they have annual rings in them, like tree rings. And we can use them as to a guide to go back in time, several hundred years, almost at monthly resolution. So, and these orange areas are where there are coral reefs in the globe today. Um, and the corals at these reefs, if you've done any snorkeling, look like this. We've got different colored corals. Now, the reason the corals are colored is because they have a pigment in them, an algae in them that's growing. So, Because coral is a funny animal. It's a, it's a unique relationship between an animal and a plant that live together. And the plant survives, provides food to the, the, to the coral, and the coral provides a house for the plant. It's this mutual relationship. But these corals are not the ones we use for climate change. We use um, these massive corals what look like this dome-shaped one here. This one is in the island of Tonga, which is in the South Pacific. And there's a diver, a snor someone on snorkel up here at the water surface looking down at this coral, which is about five feet high, about one and a half meters high. And what I'm going to talk to you about is how these corals grow. They're only alive on the outer edge, and inside of them have they have these annual rings in the skeleton. They also look like this. This is another um, genus of coral from the Panama from Panama. We collected, we um, we sampled this in uh, 2018. This is one of my graduate students for scale. And you can see there's a bumpy topography on the coral and it's got this brownish color to it. And that, that color is the pigment from the algae. This is a much, much larger coral in American Samoa, also in the South Pacific that we sampled in 2011. This coral um, is about six meters tall. So seven meters tall, and sorry, it's about 25 feet high. And it, um, the bottom dates back to 1521, the year 1521 common era or AD. So back before um, Europeans uh, moved into North America. We'll be talking about some sam from samples from this coral. This is what the side of it looks like. You can see these like platey structures so again, this coral is only alive on the outer edges. I'm going to show you in a second. It's got like a skin growing over the top of it. And underneath, you can see there's a cave under here. These corals get so big and old that they get um, burrowed underneath by organisms and they make sort of a cave structure underneath them. And this is the real reason we are using these large corals to reconstruct climate. This is a X-ray image. So this is an a a image of the density of the coral, much like you might get in the dentist's office when you get your teeth x-ray. In this case, we're x-raying the coral. And you can see these, but you can see these dark and black bands. So each one of those dark bands is one year of growth. So this is the top of the coral here in this uh, core section, which goes down to 1930, and then from 1930 back to 1840 and so forth, down to the bottom of in 1520. And we sampled along this blue line. I'll, I'll show you that more in a minute, minute here. So uh, coral, um, a couple of things I want you to learn about today is that the coral is only alive on the outer edge and the coral is very porous. And the coral is this interesting relationship between, as I said, an algae and an animal coral polyp. So the coral polyp is shown here in red and it's, um, it's got this green um, pigmented algae living with it, which is, gives it the green color. In actuality, the coral is not really red. It's sort of translucent. And sometimes the corals get rid of their algae. They kick them out when the water gets too warm and they um, turn, they look like they're white. They look bleached, but they're also very porous. And so this is one animal living in this top of this structure and they, they make their skeleton below here, below the surface and they um, step up, they grow vertic vertically towards the sunlight, about a half inch or a centimeter a year. That's how rapidly they're growing. So if you look down at the surface, we, um, I can't, I can't go back. So if you look down the top of this surface uh, with a microscope at the coral with a um, when it was alive, this is after it was uh, been sampled, you can see this is where one of the polyps would have lived in this inside of this blue box, another one would have been over here, and they're precipitating this skeleton inside of it. You can see it's got this whitish color, this dark material is um, tish, uh, dried tissue, but what I want to point out is that they're very porous. The corals are very extremely porous with all these holes in them. 
and then the, this is the white part is the skeleton, which is this mineral called calcium carbonate. And that's what we're going to we sample um, to measure the chemistry of. This is a sample that was collected in the Galapagos by one of my colleagues, Jerry Wellington. Um, he did an experiment out there where he took some corals that were growing and he stained them every six months. This is like, so this is a cut section through a coral. And it shows these pink lines are not natural. The pink lines were added. Um, it's six month increments. When it here, another six months later, there was one there, another one there, another. So there's four stain lines on here. Jerry went out um, diving and he put um, stain on, onto the coral inside of a bag and the coral took up the stain, but he was marking where it was at those instruments because he, he had instruments in the water measuring temperature, um, the salt content of the water. But this highlights nicely how the corals grow. They start out growing as one polyp, they divide into two polyps, into four, and eight, 16, and they get bigger and bigger and they grow upward and outward. And you can see they're only alive on the outer edge. So the outer edge here is where the coral was living. The rest of it is not alive. So those big, huge corals I showed you pictures of are only alive on the outer edge. And again, they're very porous inside. And they're under a lot of um, stress because the ocean is getting warmer. But they also have this very unique property of uh, these annual rings. So this is a map of the globe and the green areas are where it rains a lot, basically. But I wanted to show you where I've been working over my career, which I started doing this back in 1994, a long time ago. And I've been to all these different sites um, across the Pacific. And I'm gonna be showing you some examples from the South Pacific down in here. This is the islands of Fiji, Tonga, uh, Rarotonga and American Samoa and these four dots. But I've been working at these sites um, at different points of my career. Right now we're working on some corals from Panama I'll be talking about at the end today. So first, I'm going to show you how we collect corals underwater, what they look like underwater. We're going to be going to a site in American Samoa right in here. There's actually a uh, US National Park in American Samoa. So we're on the side of this island called Tau. And this is the island looking down from a, a Google Earth image. Um, and the coral actually is right under this red dot that we found. Um, this is what it looks like at the surface. You might not expect there's a massive seven meter high coral under this yellow arrow, but there in fact is. And there are a whole bunch of large corals along this edge of this island. You can see the island is unpopulated and it's covered with jungle and we're, we're relatively close to shore in about 30 feet of water. And we use, uh, this is our dive boat named the Leah that we put on. We put three anchors out to position the boat over the top of the coral. And we have on the boat here, we have a motor and some hoses going down to a drill, which I'll show you in a second. The motor looks like this, um, it's basically a gasoline engine hooked up to a hydraulic motor. And we, this hydraulic fluid powers our drill, which is underwater. And this is what the um, diver looks like. Um, these, these yellow bags are called lift bags where we let, raise and drop gear down to the bottom. We do this all on scuba gear. So you have to be learn how to dive and do this kind of work. It's quite fun, actually, if you're ever interested. I would re highly recommend learning how to scuba dive. And this is what our drill motor looks like. And we're going to attach drill bits onto this. Um, here, we're, we're um, underneath. You can see the dive boat at the surface of the ocean and the hoses coming down. And we're drilling to the top of the coral. And if you, if you look closely, you can see some white marks on the top of the coral. And these are actually fish bites where the fish eat the coral. There's, there's parrot fish that come down and chomp on the coral to um, get some of the tissue and they leave these little scars. This is another shot of that same coral. You can see it's partially dead on top. There are some dead areas on this side of the coral. But again, it's, again, if you imagine this is only alive on the outer upper edge, about a half inch thick. The rest of it inside is a solid sort of bone, you might say, full of those very porous material. Here's our drill motor and our, our drill string. You see we drill in these increments, we advance down um, and pull the pieces out. You can again see some of these white marks. These are the fish bite marks from the top of the coral. Um, another graphic showing the side of it. We're, gonna, we're drilling a hole down through this part of the coral. We're trying to get to the um, to the middle of it. 
And we use um, this, these devices to break the cores and get them out of the hole. And this is what the cores look like. You can see how white they are. So this is a, what the pieces of the cores look like. And we're very careful that it's like a big puzzle. They're all pieces that have to fit together perfectly. And we will mark on this section of core which way is up. So it's really important to remember, remember which way is up because we're going to piece this all back together like a jigsaw puzzle. And we use some of these long tools going down. You can see one of our drill holes here. And we, as we go deeper and deeper, we have to keep adding on these long bars to make the drill longer. We spent um, seven days working at this one coral. So we were here for our whole week doing this work. And when we're done with the coring, we actually plug the holes. And we were, we were done in this case in 2011, November, we put, there were four holes, we had drill, three holes we drilled and we plugged them with uh, concrete plugs and sealed them up because we want the coral to heal over. And we know the coral will heal over in about two years. It'll grow right over the top of these plugs and heal up completely. And actually some divers were back there in 2014. And you can't, you can't even, there's one of our drill marks there, but otherwise they, it had healed and we've been back to other corals and we know they heal over. So we don't feel like we're hurting the corals too much. Um, we plug the holes and we, um, we're following all, uh, we get permits to do this work from all the countries we go to. And this is what the corals look like back on land. Um, this is in this American Samoa just after we collected them. So this longest one goes from, uh, dates from 2011, goes back to 1521. And so that what I just showed you was the fast part of the work, the fun part of the work. And when we get back into the lab, we'll spend years analyzing these cores. Um, it takes a long time. In this case, we have these three long cores from that one colony and some other short ones here. So we'll get the cores back into the lab and we'll um, line them up and we'll cut them along this growth axis. So I don't know if you can see my, see my image in the screen, but this is what I was going to I was going to do this uh, webinar in my lab showing you actual samples and how we collect them, but because we have a snow day and the lab is closed, I can't do that. But this is what the cores look like. And we cut them in half. And we cut out a slab out of the middle, which is like what this slab looks like. And we'll x ray it. I don't know if you can see this or not, but I have some other pictures of this. Is there other corals from Panama? And you can see these corals from Panama have holes in them where worms have burrowed into them. And there's a lot of dead zones because the corals are under some stress from what's called coral bleaching. It's a disease where the corals lose their algae and can die. Oops, sorry. This is another example of a coral from uh, Tonga. We, we uh, cored, it was actually dead on top and live on the sides. It was really shallow. We were able to stand on top of it. And it turns out it died in 1982 during what's called the El Nino event, when the sea level dropped literally about two or three inches only and was so shallow, but that, that small change in water depth um, killed the top of the coral. And then, uh, but it was live on the sides. So we were able to uh, take a core from the side here and a core from the middle and go back. This coral goes back to 1793, the usable part. You can see where we sampled it, but it has really, and each one of these bands is again, an annual ring. So unlike trees though, which grow like around here in New York, they grow only in the spring and summer. And these corals are growing continuously year round. They just they lay down the dense part, the dense bands, they grow a little more slowly, but they're growing all year long. So back in the lab, we use little tiny drills like these shown here, sometimes with handheld drills, which is, the, this is the head of one of those, or we use a, a little mill, we'll put the coral slab on this plexiglass glass plate and we'll sample it every, um, usually every millimeter, which is, turns into a, about 12 samples or so per year. So almost monthly resolution. And we'll sample down these, along these sample paths. Um, for reasons I don't have time to get into, we have to sample uh, perpendicular to the growth bands. So that's why we have these angled Paths. And if you look closely at this image, you can actually see the individual coral polyps, like these coral light traces, these little vertical lines in here are where the individual animals are growing. So you can see they grow in these sort of growth axes where they spread outward. And sometimes it gets kind of complicated to sample them. 
So these are some graphics that actually were in that um, Reuters article I mentioned to you, if you wanna check that out. This is a top of a coral from Tonga, where we, this is the X-ray, and we marked out um, the annual, where the annual bottoms of the bait rings were, and where we then we sampled it down the middle of this, of this growth axis. You can see where we actually sampled it with those millimeter, every millimeter was sampled. And this coral was three, two meters long. So we had at least 2000 samples that we collected by hand, which is why it takes a long time in the lab to analyze these. Um, another example of what the sample coral looks like. Sometimes the sample paths are curved like this. And these are every millimeter, these markers on here. So that's one centimeter of growth from there to there and every millimeter. So again, so it's growing about 10 or 12 millimeters per year. So then we did, we'll, then we'll, we'll do, um, we do measure the chemistry of the skeleton, depending on where we are and what we're doing, we measure different aspects of the chemistry. And this I realize is gonna be more complicated for many of you, but um, the, the, we do measure things called oxygen isotopes and carbon isotopes. And we measured some metals, like strontium, and we also met the metal barium. And I'm gonna show you some data from strontium and some barium data. And this oxygen isotope tracer um, is, a, is a function, uh, responds to both temperature and, and what's called salinity, the salt content of the water. So we're looking at variations in temperature, trying to understand how the ocean temperature changes in the past. And we also use this barium to, as a, tracer of river flow, river discharge. This is what the inside of my lab looks like at Lamont Doherty. Again, I couldn't be there today with you, but we have these multiple machines for measuring um, these different, uh, different types of different elements and isotopes in the coral samples. So we spent a lot of time in the lab analyzing these. Um, so this is a pretty clear example of what we're trying to do. So this is the comparison of what's called the strontium. There's a, there's a metal called strontium. The symbol is S SR. And that's the black open dots. And the red line is actually water temperature data collected from a satellite. And the green is temperature data from a thermometer we left in the water over the course of a year. This goes from 1998 back to 1981. But I, you, you can see that there's a very strong agreement between the this, this metal strontium and water temperature. And so we, we can use the relationships like this to then reconstruct what temperature is, how it was varying in, in the past before the instrumental data, which actually started right here in 1982. So before that, we don't know much about temperature variability at this site. So this is one example of that. We took data from these three different cores, um, from Fiji, Tonga, and Rarotonga in the yellow circles here and average them together. So what's an average? I realize, whoop. I mean, not everyone knows what an average is. Well, average, we also call a mean. And an average is, is sort of the midpoint. So if we added numbers four, five, and six together, four plus five plus six, the average of those numbers would be five. Four plus five plus six divided by three, because there's three numbers, gives us a mean of five. In this case, we made an average of the coral data from these three sites. And this is case, this this is the temperature proxy, temperature tracer. And you can see them in the red data is actually instrumental data. And there's some gaps in the data. And it's um, not a perfect agreement between our temperature data and the instrumental data, but pretty good. And you can see it's it's relatively warm now in the in around the late we call it 20th century. This is the year 2000. It's also relatively warm here in the early 1800s. It's almost as warm as today. We don't understand why that is. Um, we we're actually trying to under, further understand that. So we're learning a lot about how temperature varied in the ocean over time. And you see this, it's not just constant changes. There are these large changes in temperature that occur on sort of multi -decade, decades every 10 or 20 years. And we can also do the same thing um, with this, what's called oxygen isotopes, which I don't have time to get into all the details of, but it's, a, it's related to both temperature and the salt content of the water or, or rainfall. In this case, we're replicating the signal. So in this case, I use the word replicate, which means like copy. We're gonna try to see how well this 
the, the, the oxygen isotope data from one core replicates in another or copies. In this case, you can see at Rarotonga, we have three cores here overlap, and at Fiji, we have two. You could clearly see, or I think you could see that th these um, data sets replicate, which means it's we're getting the same um, signal at each of these sites. And the, all these data sets show this trend, if you notice that, this trend towards values that are increasing. And we think this is a warming trend. And also possibly the water oceans getting fresher, less salt, maybe more rainfall. We still don't know the answer to that question and we're working on it. But the fact that these replicate is, in good, is good news for us. It's encouraging because it means the corals are recording what's going on in the water. At a really long site in American Samoa, the one I showed you, this goes back to 1521. This is that same tracer. And you can see this, not much of a trend here up to about 17, sort of right around the time of the American Revolution, which was 1776 to 1782, I think. And then there was sort of a step up increase and there's been this trend of um, potentially warming and increasing rainfall since then. And so we're also looking more into that. We have more work to do about that. In the last example I'm gonna show you is a project we're working on right now in Panama. It's actually quite a fascinating project to me. We're working on some corals collected over here in what's called the uh, Panama's here in Central America. And what's really important about the Panama Canal, well it's, well, it's a very beautiful country. It's also a major shipping route. The Panama Canal goes right through here, just to the uh, this side of Panama City and it goes up and into the Caribbean there. And it, and they use, um, they bring ships through the canal by water that's in this artificial lake in the middle of Panama. And they use the water in that lake to raise the ships up and to lower them down. And it turns out when there's, um, they don't use any pumps. It's all done by just simply gravity drain. And when there's not enough water, if there's not enough rainfall, there's not enough water to raise and lower ships. They have to, um, they can't bring the big, big ships through the canal. They have to reduce the size of the ships. So it's, uh, we're trying to understand past changes in rainfall by understanding coral chemistry here in Panama. And the way we're doing that is, um, well, this is a picture of uh, us drilling. And one of the reasons, uh, in this case, we were drilling, and this was in March, 2018, and the water was really cloudy this day. You can see it's very low visibility. This is because of river discharge. All these pine particles in the water are coming from rivers and there's lots of rivers and lots of rainfall in Panama, which brings all this material into the water, which is actually rich in this metal called barium. And we're actually measuring the barium chemistry of the corals. So this, and this is another data plot. I sorry, but we have the younger part of the record is here on the right, and the older parts on the left. It goes from 1985 to 1955. And the red dots are the barium chemistry of the coral, the barium concentration. You can see it's increasing upward. And the red and the green, I'm sorry, the blue and the green curves are river flow, how much water is coming out of the rivers in Panama. And you can see there's a really nice um, correlation, we say, the word, we use the word correlate, correlation between barium chem content, there's more barium when there's more river flow. And so these times of low river discharge are droughts. This is when the Panama Canal would have had a hard time bringing big ships through. And so we're we're right, right now, we have a, a new project we've just started, or we're trying to get started in the pandemic to analyze barium content of this coral, which goes back to 1707. It's like, and here's the canal, and this is what the ships look like that go through the Panama Canal. These are called Panamax ships. They fit, they're designed to fit perfectly inside the canal locks because the canal is only so wide. And now all these are the, these red arrows point to years when there were droughts, when they had to reduce the size of ships on the canal. So this occurred in 1962, 63, 1965, 1976, 82, uh, 1997. These are actually El, El Nino events, if you know about El Nino. It's, we have big droughts in Panama during El Nino. So we're currently working to um, this is the data I just showed you from that coral. We only analyzed this part of it so far, but the coral itself goes to the bottom. Here's 1707. This is the Declaration of Independence was signed here in 1776. This coral goes back very far, and we're hoping to understand 
patterns of drought and floods in Panama over this 250 year long coral record when we're all done, but we're in the lab right now working on this. I have two students helping me and a, and a faculty member, a colleague of mine at Barnard College is helping on the project. So I'll stop there. Um, that's more data I could show you, but I think that's probably plenty for now. It gives you a sense of what I do and how we do the work and how time consuming and fun it is. Thank you. That's great. Thank you so much, Brad. Um, we have quite a few really great questions, actually. Um, so I'm going to try and go back um, and start with some of the, the first ones. I know a few people have asked multiple questions. I'll do my best to get to all of them. Um, so one of the first questions that came up was, how do corals actually form? So that's a very interesting question. So corals reproduce two ways. They can, um, what's called, they can bud. They can, one polyp can bud in from one to two. So they can, one polyp can divide itself and become two polyps. Two polyps then will divide and become four into eight. And they can also reproduce sexually when they I mean they release eggs and sperm into the water and the fertilized egg will land on a surface and start growing. So they have these two ways of reproducing. Okay. Thank you. And this is sort of related, you know, how deep can they grow? I mean, you mentioned some of the sizes of the ones that you showed us photos to, um, but how, yeah, how, how deep can they go? So the corals I showed you are all, um, all involve algae. So they have to be living in the shallow parts of the ocean where there's enough sunlight, mm -hmm. which can be down, depending on how clear the water is, we've seen corals growing down up 80 feet down or hundred feet down in some sites. There are other types of corals that do not have algae that can live in really deep parts of the ocean, but they do not have, they don't have any energy from the sun. They get all their energy from filter feeding, eating out of the water. But all these corals are of these algae. So they live in the shallow surface. You're down, typically they're 30 to 40 feet in the water. Okay, great. Um, and then sort of related, uh, do corals need water to live or does it need more? Um, like you said, you know, sunlight is, is um, sort of ideal, but are there other conditions in which they, they thrive under? So corals, um, it's actually a very good question and we're still learning about corals, but they need sunlight to grow. They need, um, they're also, they, they're, some colleagues have referred to them as carnivorous plants because the animal itself filter feeds and eats plankton in the water. So they need a, that kind of food source. If the water gets too cloudy or full, full of sediment from like river discharge, or they can kill the corals. And if it gets too warm, it turns out, like just you and I, get, we get used to living in a certain temperature. If the water gets too warm, the corals will get rid of their algae and then die sometimes. So we're learning about that the temperature is a, um, they have to be in a certain temperature range to be happy. Okay, great. Um, a couple of uh, personal questions. Um, are you in any of the photos that you showed us um, scuba diving? And you know how many uh, coral reefs have you seen personally? Oh. <laughs> I took most of the pictures. Actually, this picture, if, if you can still see my screen, this is me in the blue. Okay, great. That's me <laughs> behind the fish. Yep. Someone else took that picture. But the other pictures I took, we usually work with three or four divers underneath the, on the water at a time. And, so I happen to have my camera with me and I take a lot of pictures. I like taking pictures. Yeah. And in terms of how many- Oh, how many, how many sites have I been to? Yeah. We go back to that map, um, this map here. I've been to all these sites on these, all these blue dots over the, usually in two to three week expeditions to each one. Um, and actually, while we're on this map, there is a related question about sort of where corals, uh, what bodies of waters do corals tend to, to live in? And I see that there are some, there are clearly some spots where they kind of, um, they, they're more popular than others. So that's a good question. Let's go back yeah. to that map though, early on. The orange dots, yeah, maybe. This map. So this map was in the Reuters article. I encourage you to go read that article. It's very well done. Uh, I was very impressed with the, the writer who did that and the, the graphics people. So this is the, all the orange on here are where corals are actively alive now. And you can see 
they're mostly on um, uh, in the Caribbean and this, uh, this uh, part of the world, but in the Western Pacific, all these areas are full of uh, coral reefs. So there's uh, sort of, they call it the coral sort of triangle area here in Indonesia, a lot of active coral growth. And these areas are very warm. The water is very warm in this part of the world and relatively clear. So the corals need warm water. Um, there are corals in Bermuda, which is that dot right there, but that's about as far north and even in Hawaii, there are corals, but their corals are there are not as big as the ones I showed you. Okay. Great, thank you. Um, we have a couple of questions related to, are there animals that live inside the corals, um, such as fish? Yes, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but I, one of, I'm not a biologist, but I was very shocked to find that all these tropical fish have little territorial places they live in, little houses. So when we would drill a hole in the coral, the first thing that would happen, well, even before we got our gear out of the way, the fish would try to move into the hole because it's a new house. And they were unhappy when we plugged the hole up with a plug. But the fish, they live under the corals and they live in the coral. There are fish that clean the coral and there's other fish that eat the coral. That's huge. The coral provides a ecosystem for all sorts of life, mostly fish, but also invertebrates that live under the coral. And there's and also there's worms inside the coral. I showed you some pictures of holes in the corals. Those are bored by these worms, lithophag worm, Christmas tree worms are called, mm -hmm. that live inside the coral. Okay. Oh, cool. Great. Yes. Lots of questions related to what actually lives, uh, what types of animals live in corals. Um, do you know how many types of corals there are? I do not. I know I'd be <laughs> widely guessing how many species there are, but there are certainly hundreds of species of corals. Um, some corals are soft corals. They don't have hard parts okay. and they don't like, they don't get, when the coral dies, they don't, there's no hard part left over. Whereas the corals I showed you are all um, have hard skeletons and those when the coral dies, there is hard part left over. Okay. And some of those get buried into the, into the rock, the geologic record, you just find them fossilized corals, for example. Okay, great. Um, oh my gosh, so many great questions. Um, so because you showed us some images um, of how you've x-rayed the, the corals, um, someone has asked if there are similarities uh, or differences of coral growth and sort of human bone growth. Um, and then the, the other question was sort of just about the process of x-raying and I guess the, the tools and the machines that you need in order to do this yeah. analysis. Well, I'm not a medical doctor, but our bones are porous, much like coral skeletons, although the bones are formed in different ways. Um, these corals grow, um, the, the porous skeletons, um, the coral makes this architecture and it, basically the coral is competing with its neighbor to grow vertically, to outcompete it for sunlight. So that's why they have these growth axes. And I think they're sort of racing to get more, better position to get more sunlight. The, um, and you can see the porosity here too. And you can see the very, these, these little tips where the coral was most recently calcifying. And they, so they calcify along this irregular surface with all this porous structure. Now the, the x-rays, um, we cut the corals in half. I'm gonna show you the, I didn't have a picture of my x-ray machine, but we'll cut them in half along this, like this black line and we'll cut a slab off of which is a, we found about seven millimeters thick is the best for these. And we put them in an x-ray machine I have in my lab. It's a, we pass x-ray energy through them for about two minutes. And then we make a, a pic, a, a, we develop the image and make the, those black and white photographs I showed you, these, these things. And you can see the, so in these black and white positives, the, the darker areas are the dense, denser parts of the skeleton. And the lighter areas are the low density part of the skeleton. And so one year of growth goes from the bottom of one dense band to the bottom of the next one. Okay. Good question. Yeah, very great questions. Um, have you ever started, I think this was a question, um, uh, have you ever started drilling and realized that you perhaps couldn't continue to drill uh, for a coral? Um, and, you know, does the drilling hurt the coral in the, in the I think you, you said, you know, it, it does grow back, but does it hurt it immediately um, as you're, as you're drilling? So we're, we're um, 
I don't think we're helping the corals by putting holes in them, um, but we don't, I don't think we're hurting them either. We, because we, they do heal over at the top. Um, and lots of other things kill coral. There's a, a water temperature that this thing's called these starfish that go, go through an area and decimate corals in big waves. Everywhere we've been, you see corals upside down, big waves have knocked them over. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think we're, hurting the corals too much. We do look, we do, they do heal. We've been back to a couple sites and we've seen that healed right over. We couldn't even see ours, the where we drilled them. Um, and the, um, oh, the first part, other part of the question was sometimes we, we will, because because we're putting together these puzzle pieces, if they, these pieces don't fit together, like if we drill down, all of a sudden we hit a hole under the coral or something breaks and we can't figure like the, the, one of these pieces might fragment and then we can't figure out how to put it back together. We have to stop the hole and start another one because we, because we count from the top and we count backwards in time going to the bottom. So if we're missing a piece and such, we don't know then how old the material is below it. And that we can't, it's very important that we know exactly what year we're in. Otherwise our data is not going to be uh, as, as valuable. Right. Okay. And, um, you know, you talked a little bit about ocean acidification at the beginning, um, and there's a couple of questions about how um, th those processes are affecting coral growth or, um, and how they're, or just corals in, in general, if you could comment on that. So the, the pH of the ocean has become slightly more acidic. Um, it hasn't become that much more acidic, a little bit. And so we've been looking for evidence of, um, ocean acidification on the effects because of the, you predict that it would be harder for organisms that make hard skeletons to calcify and under more acidic conditions. And I didn't have time, but we published a paper uh, two years ago looking at some of these corals in the South Pacific. Um, and there's, there was an interesting change in the, the, how the corals grow, the rate at which they're growing uh, in, in this tracer called carbon isotopes. And I don't have time to get into that, but there, there seems to be there's some something happened in the around 1970, 1980, and a bunch of corals at Fiji, Tonga, and Rarotonga that um, I suspect is related to ocean acidification that we haven't been able to prove it yet. Um, other people in the lab have taken corals and they put they put them under stress tests. They'll change the pH of the acidity of the solution they're living in, and they'll try to see if they by changing the pH whether they'll bleach or die or um, and there's numerous studies like that, but they have to they have to change the pH a lot to get them to re respond. And right now, in the natural environment, the pH change has not been that much. Okay, all right, good to know. Um, how are the coral sites in sort of American Samoa have been different than coral sites in other places that you've um, you've been in and and seen, like Panama, for example, or or perhaps what you know of the differences between American Samoa, the, the Caribbean, the Mediterranean? That's a good question. So um, these large corals don't exist everywhere. Um, we found really large corals in Panama and in American Samoa, Tonga, Fiji, and Rarotonga. Tonga. And, but if you go up on the equator or along here, the corals aren't as Long, or the same species of coral doesn't get as big. And we suspect they're getting killed by El Nino events. So it turns out this, this species of coral that we analyze in the Pacific doesn't even grow in the Atlantic. There's, there's completely different types of corals in the Atlantic Ocean. They, some of them not get really big, but it's a different species of coral completely, actually different genus, genus of coral. Um, and the coral reefs in the Caribbean are much more, um, have been much more stressed. There's been a lot more coral death um, probably related to human development of islands there, and less so at some of these remote sites in the in the Pacific. But there's still been a lot of coral damage in places where people live, unfortunately. Did I answer the question? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I'm just looking at the and you know, people are still coming in with with great questions um, and trying to see if I can find a theme along some of them. Um, I think some of it is also about your scuba scuba diving and you know when you dive, you know, do you see you must see a lot of fish and you know do you see a lot of fish and what are some of the most interesting fish you've seen? So I I grew up on the Connecticut shore mm -hmm. and I was always love the water. I didn't learn to scuba dive though till 19, just before my first trip to actually went to Clipperton Island. 
and I learned of scuba dive just to go on that trip. I had never been diving before. And as soon as I got underwater um, and became neutrally buoyant and was able to hover in the water, I thought, wow, this is fast. This is fantastic. You either like it or you don't. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and unfortunately, I was spoiled. The very first place I went was Clipperton Atoll, and it was just remarkable how much wildlife was there. Fish everywhere and huge corals and and, every, and all the reefs in uh, Samoa and Tonga are also pretty extraordinary. But other places we've been to, the corals are under a lot, lot more stress. Our trip to Panama in 2018, there's a lot of dead corals everywhere. Um, and so we, th we think that trend is going in the wrong direction, that the corals are um, been dying and sometimes they regrow and sometimes they don't. Okay. And there's still strange things going on in the, um, I'll just digress a little bit, but I was in Tonga. Um, we had to, we did a little, we had to get, take an observer with us, but the observer wasn't ready. So we did a little dive in around the South Island of Tonga and all the corals were in bad, bad shape. We went back um, to pick up our observer and I went to talk to the minister of the environment who gave us the permit to work there. And I said, why are the, why are the reefs so bad around this island? And he said, oh, dynamite fishing, he said, because they're still, not that long ago, and that means they throw dynamite in the water and explodes and it kills everything. And the fish float to the surface and the fishermen scoop them up but it destroys all the corals in the process. So hope, some of that stuff, hopefully we can stop, yeah. um, give them other ways to fish you know, sustainably. Yeah, sure. Um, and this is, a, this is an interesting question. So that image you showed us where the, the coral that you found was in very shallow waters. Um, and can can corals only grow if they're in or touching water? Um, and could the would the coral die if it was not surrounded or with it in in water? So if the coral gets above water, it will die. Yes. So you find most coral reefs, um, the reef crest is really near the sea surface, and most a lot of the corals on the reef crest are actually struggling. They're a little bit too shallow. Okay. And they partly die because there's too much ultraviolet radiation from the sun and they can pot deal with a little bit of exposure but it's this ultraviolet radiation that seems to do them in so they tend to live a little bit you know deeper than that maybe starting around five to ten to 15 to 20 feet down um, so this coral was dead on top um, and we were able to stand on top of it but it had it had been living at that depth until 1982 when it died from that big el nino event mm -hmm. But normally we don't sample corals this way. Okay, you got it. Okay, so I'm gonna hit pause on Brad's question and answer for a little minute, uh, for a little bit. Um, so Brad, there's if you can, if you stop sharing your screen, you can see some of the questions in the Q and A box. I'm gonna take a second and let um, and bring Matt Pierce from NASA GIS. Give me one second here while I. Um, bring Matt on and he's going to talk a little bit about uh, NASA GIS resources. So Brad, if you if you can stay on for a minute, great. And you can, what you can do is in the Q&A box, you can see, you can type answers. Um, I know we've answered some of the, some of the questions already. Um, but what, so, so there's two, one says answer live, one says type answer. I should yeah. be typing. So you can type your answer okay. um, while kind of Matt goes okay. over his, okay. his resources if you'd like. Um, Matt, I'm going to share my screen, which has the uh, NASA resources. And if you just want to start talking about those, that would be great. Awesome. Great. Hi, everyone. And, and thank you, uh, Dr. Lindsay. That was an awesome presentation. Um, I love corals. I've always been fascinated by them. I'm always inspired by how delicate they are and how much they impact unique ecosystems. And, and you've inspired me to do something I've always wanted to do, and that's go scuba diving. Yeah. Uh, so it's been on my list for a long time. And uh, we've got a little dive shop down the street. I think I'm going to go start exploring. Um, so thank you for, for an awesome presentation. And hi, everyone. I'm, I'm glad to take a few moments to meet with all the students on the line and teachers. My name is Matt Pierce, and I lead NASA's Office of STEM Engagement at the Goddard Institute for Space Studies in New York City. Uh, we call um, my center GIS as an acronym for Goddard Institute for Space Studies. And at, at GIS, we study a whole lot of the different variables that affect climate. 
um, from climate impacts to climate modeling to various ecosystem changes, all that, that contribute to global warming, um, both in and around New York, but also around the world. Um, we have many ocean scientists and atmospheric scientists, and it's a, a, a great, great center. And, and we work closely with our friends over at Lamont and Columbia, and uh, there are a lot of great people doing some amazing work to protect the, the climate. So I wanted to just share a few resources that uh, might be of interest to you that are relevant to this topic um, that NASA puts out that hopefully you'll enjoy exploring a little bit. Um, so the first one, we're gonna talk about three real quick ones, NASA NEMO-NET, Earth 360, and then we have a coral bleaching simulator. Um, and the first one I'd like to talk about is the NASA NEMO um, net. This is, if you have an iPad or a smartphone, or uh, you can even do this on, on a laptop computer, uh, NASA has created a kind of gamified an opportunity for students and citizen scientists all over the world to help us classify different types of corals. And we really need your help to do this because we're trying to get a better per perception of what is the health of the various coral reefs. And so the images that are in this platform are actual photographs and satellite data from CubeSats and, and other instruments that have mapped out a variety of corals. And NASA needs your help to go to this site and explore and, and go through their protocols and, and classify the different types. As you saw, Dr. Lindsay was mentioning that, you know, certain types of corals uh, that may have existed in the Pacific don't necessarily exist in the Atlantic. And there's a lot of uh, structural and uh, physical changes uh, across the globe for these very important ecosystems. So I've gotten tremendous feedback from other students I've worked with that seem to really enjoy and have a lot of fun with this. And when you're, you're, when you're playing this, while it's built to feel a little bit like a game, I want you to understand that you're contributing to NASA's research when you're, when you're playing this and you're contributing to that body of work. Um, so it's a neat opportunity. Uh, can you do the next slide? So another site I want you to check out, and I know I, I can't seem to send you the links through this, so you can just do a screen capture of this. And I know uh, we'll have the links up on the website for you in a few days, or you can just Google the, the key names. But on, uh, on our Earth360 site, you can learn a whole lot about Earth science. Um, one of the things you can do is, is kind of go alongside with some scientists that are studying the coral reefs in Hawaii and might be able to, to learn some, some new uh, tricks and, and tips and insights about how uh, corals are, are being impacted in that area. But there's also a lot of other information that impacts the ocean there. We have missions called Operation Icebridge which is a plane that flies over the glacial ice sheets and is, is we're trying to monitor the melting of those ice sheets. And when those ice sheets melt, that's gonna change the temperature uh, in the ocean and, and could, be, could affect food supply, it could affect corals. Um, so we're also studying that. So please you know, engage and explore and let your mind wander. That's a great website um, to, to learn a lot about climate modeling and activities and games and videos. And one more slide, please. And this is a fun simulator. Um, if you Google coral bleaching simulator climate kids, you'll get to this site. But this is a fun uh, little simulation that really shows you the balance between uh, the water temperature and water pollution and how that could affect a coral reef. And when you when you play this, there's a little coral reef at the bottom of it. and there's a boat and you can actually start a storm if you push that green button in the middle. And, and that also has impacts on the coral reef's health. So it's, again, another site that you can, you can learn a whole lot of other things on. Um, but I know Dr. Lindsay mentioned coral bleaching earlier in his talk, and, and this might be a, a, a good quick thing to look at. So with that said, those are just a few NASA education resources that I hope you'll enjoy and explore. Um, and if you ever are curious about anything else related to these topics or science, 
please feel free to uh, look me up and reach out. Thanks, everyone. Keep up the great work. Great. Thank you, Matt. Um, Brad, I see you're still busily answering questions. <laughs> There's still uh, a lot great of questions. Great, great questions. Um, a lot of comments. Um, so I think, do you want to, Brad, would you like me to try to summarize some of these? Um, I think some of these have been things you have answered already. Um, and if I'm happy to collect some, uh, we're almost at five, so I want to respect everyone's time here. Um, I am also happy to collect some of these questions that haven't been answered and uh, send them over to you via email. Um, what would you What would you like to do? We have some some kudos for you. Thank you for a great presentation. Um, first grade students also loved it. <laughs> which oh, is good. Great. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I can keep answering, or you could, if you can send them to me, I can type up answers that I don't know how do you, do you distribute them to people or would you post them somewhere yeah we could post them so let's see if you have some time um I'm happy to I can answer questions now too yeah verbally, let's, or... let's do a few more um for those who are still on that that would be great um we we'll I... at this one right now about fish bites yeah so go for it. fish bites are some of the corals are heavily fish bitten particularly in, in Clipperton you, these big parrot fish come down and chomp on the coral and you actually watch them. They eat the tissue and they spit out the skeleton. They leave a little like divot mark in the coral, much like when you swing your golf club and divot up the grass. It looks kind of like that. And the coral, though it's much smaller and the coral heals over. But and when we cut those cores open, we can actually see these little scallop marks in the coral core where the fish had bitten it. They're like little scars. Okay, great. Um, and then I think, so this was, uh, so when was the last time you did, um, some coral research and, and work, um, and yesterday also I was in the lab oh, yesterday well, weighing yeah. coral samples, but my last field trip was in <laughs> Panama in, uh, 2018. Okay, great. Um, and then there was a, a couple more sort of general questions. Do you have a favorite coral? Um, and do they come in all different uh, shapes and sizes? Well, my favorite coral, which has made my career, is this genus called Parites, P-O-R-I-T-E-S, Parites. And there's different main species. One's called Lutea, and one's called Lobata. Lobata just means they're a little more lobate on the surface. Um, so that's my favorite coral. Um, what was the other part of the question? Uh, um, uh, can they come in a lot of different shapes and sizes? Oh, yes. Yeah. So corals, just like people, look, look yeah. come in. They're all individuals. I haven't seen any two colonies look exactly the same. They're always a little bit irregular. Sometimes they're skinny and tall. Sometimes they're round and squat. And sometimes they have a stalk like a mushroom. If you cut them and have you look like there was a, it was like, just like a mushroom. You have a central stalk. Sometimes they're so big, there's no stalk at all. There's a cave underneath with yeah. fish living inside of it. Yeah. Great. Um, I think, I think we might have answered this one, but there are a couple of these have popped up. So um, how deep can they grow? So the corals that I was talking about are the photosynthetic corals that need sunlight. So they can, I've seen them as living as deep as a hundred feet or so down, but they grow pretty slowly at that depth. There's, they seem to, they want to be around 30 or 40 feet. And if they don't have the algae though, there's different genus of coral that live in the very deep ocean where it's completely dark and there's no light at all. And they grow very, very slowly and they don't look like this. So they look, they look more like um, small trees. They have little branches and central stalks and they have polyps on the ends of the stalks, but they don't have these, don't like massive structures like ones I showed you. Okay. Um, and this, there's an interesting question here about um, can they, so someone asked if they can be uh, relocated to a preferred environment if there are um, if their current environment is not necessarily safer or conducive for them um, or whether or not they can be genetically modified um, to better withstand uh, changing water temperatures um, well, uh, the first part of the question is the, the big corals are just simply too big to move around um, but pe people do take smaller ones and move them into um, what you might call a hatchery, or then they try to, or into the lab, and they'll try to, they're trying to repopulate reefs by encouraging 
the juvenile corals to grow more rapidly, then they'll, they'll take the small little colonies, which might be the size of my fist, and put it out into the reef and, and some sort of grid pattern. And whether people are trying to genetically modify them, they may be trying to um, use adaptive biology to see you know, which corals are more like temperature tolerant um, in trying to, there are effort, efforts underway to rebuild coral reefs. Um, and the US government is actually trying to start funding this work, um, trying to rebuild both oyster reefs and coral reefs. Um, and they're gonna mostly with it, what's called adaptive biology, where they're trying to selectively take the coral, coral lines or the coral types that seem to do better than others for reasons we don't totally understand still. There's a lot of work to do. I can't stress that enough. If you want to get interested in this kind of work, there's a lot more work to do. We have, do not have all the answers at all. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Um, and, you know, you mentioned, um, you know, some of these local practices like dynamite fishing. And there's a question that was um, about whether or not tourism has actually affected, you know, your, your research or your work. Um, I think, you know, in a lot of places where you do your work, there's a lot of, you know, islands and tourist uh, demands to, to build those islands. Uh, so curious how, how the role of tourism um, is factored into your research. So, um, I mean, I guess you might say that too many people on the reef is a bad thing, but I've noticed now anywhere you go, there's um, anyone that's out snorkeling on the reef, there's strict instructions to not touch the you know, reef with your fins. You need to, they try to really minimize impacts of that. Yeah. In places like Fiji, the government of Fiji has realized how important the corals are to both their, their, their ecosystem, but also for the tourist business. So they they're very proactive about um, protecting their reef and wanting to do research on it to understand how to protect it and how to facilitate having corals, coral reefs being healthy for the next century. So in that, in that respect, the tourism has been a benefit because the government of Fiji is now actively trying to manage the situation. And, um, and we have to get permits and convince them that we're not gonna hurt the coral and what we're doing is actually beneficial, trying to understand how rapidly the water's warming or cooling or acidifying and so forth. Um, okay, that's great, very helpful. A good question. Um, yeah, um, for, you know, before we all started to work remotely, um, how, you know, what was, uh, how many corals did you find in a year? Or did you, you know, drill in a year um, if you were going on a lot of, uh, doing a lot of field work? So I, I need to stress, and I, I'll say it again, that the field work is the easy part. Yeah. So we go out for two, you know, two weeks and we'll collect mm -hmm. four cores that are, you know, so many meters long. I will literally spend four years in the lab analyzing them. It's wow. so time consuming. Do we have thousands and thousands of samples that we can only analyze so many a day and mm -hmm. it's very expensive to analyze them. So we spend a lot of time trying to raise money to just generate the analyses. Yeah. And we're, we're still learning about things that we can analyze too. This, this work in Panama, we had these corals a long time ago. We didn't realize the barium chemistry was interesting or related to river discharge. Mm -hmm. So literally we'll, we're spe we spend years in the lab. And so yeah. I tend to go out every two to three years, it seems, um, but it's not, there's nothing, there's no predictable frequency to my field visits. It's just sort of when we can get funding to go and have a team of people go and- yeah have a scientific question we're trying to answer. That's how you get funded. Right. Yeah, and I think you, you've hit a little bit on, there's a question about the, some of the challenging parts of your career. Um, so, you know, trying to get um, funding for, for continuing to do this type of work, I'm sure has come up as, as a challenge. Are there, are there other things that are challenging? Well, if you can get funding, um, one of the challenges you get a lot, it's sort of a chicken or the egg question you get from people that review our proposals is because you, if you don't have a long coral core ready, um, you have to first convince them that you're gonna find them before you can analyze them. Um, the other challenging part is actually getting permission to do some of the work. Um, some of the countries are, have very strict and uh, complicated permitting processes like Panama, for example. So literally it took us over, over a year and a half to get permits approved to go oh. work in Panama. Yeah. yeah. And a little bit of a bribe money here and there. <laughs> <laughs> I 
this is being recorded. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So I think we, this is, I'm going to ask one last question, which has not come up yet. Um, how do you travel with the samples that you collect? Um, and, you know, do they have to be stay within certain temperatures or conditions? Um, and I think this is a, this is a good way to, to end, you know, once you've done the diving and done the drilling, how do you get it back to the lab and uh, store it safely? So the, the corals, um, the coral drill itself is shipped in a, several boxes. We don't, we don't fly with it. It gets shipped by air cargo or uh, on a ship even. We send it on ships a lot. And once we collect the cores, the corals aren't alive. Once they come out of the water, there's that little tiny top of the core that actually was alive. We, we do unfortunately kill that part of it. But then, so then the corals get, we put into um, boxes or crates and they get shipped back. They have to be, we have to get import, export and import permits for them. They're called CITES permits because corals are an endangered group of organisms. And so particularly the ones we work on. So we have to get permission first to export them from say Fiji. And then we have to get permission to import them to the US. Yeah. And then they, usually they come by either air cargo or by ship. Okay. All right, cool. Well, Brad, thank you so much for your time and for taking extra time to answer questions. Um, we have a few questions left, um, but if for, for those of you who are still on, um, if you have any additional sort of burning questions, let me know. Um, Brad, I'll take a quick sort of screenshot of some of these. Um, and I think if there was anything that we did not get to, um, I'll uh, forward those to, to you um, and then we'll uh, get them on, a, on the EI Live website for everybody who's still here. We'll send out the recording. We'll send out the link to the Reuters article as well as the resources that Matt talked about from NASA. Um, thank you so much for, for tuning in everybody. Um, Brad, any last sort of comments? The, the last thing I'll say is once the pandemic's over, yeah. Lamont Doherty has an annual open house every fall. Um, it's usually in October on Saturday. And we always have a coral exhibit there. We have the cores laid out, people can come by. It's great for um, families and children. Um, it's a big event. They run buses from the city up and back. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to do this again ne live next fall. Yeah. So please come by. Um, yeah, definitely. And even if we can't see you in person, we'll definitely, I mean, there's clearly from today, there's such great interest in coral. So we'll definitely do something for open house um, this year around coral. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks so much, Brad. Um, have a good rest of your afternoon. And to our audience, thank you so much for tuning in and hope you uh, hope to see you for another session. All right. Thanks, thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye.